Welcome to Social Issues. Um, last week was what? What was the topic last week? Great Lakes. You're right. You tricked me. What was the topic before that? Two weeks ago. It's been, it's been one of those summers, hasn't it? Sexuality. What, uh, what did Brother Frank, what he was supposed to teach us? I don't know if he actually did. I was houseboat. <laughs> thought about you every day. Yeah. What, what did he talk about regarding homosexuality? Or some of the. Say again? Okay. Talk about transgender at all? No? Can't get there? Alright. Um, what's the first, first week one? What did we talk about? This was like three, four weeks ago. Post truth. If I had candy, pick it up. What's post truth? He's like, man, I left college. There's like no more quizzes in life. What's up with that? Post truth. What was post truth all about? Week one, we talked about world views. We talked about post truth. Post truth. Nice guess. Specifically, what was it about pro people that have a post-truth paradigm, a post-truth philosophy? What is it that they base their truth on? I use the right word here. Feeling. Emotion. Feeling, not based on fact. Okay. We'll talk about all the repercussions of that. Uh, next, the following week, like we talked about, was homosexuality. Then we had GOSC. Today, we're going to talk about Meaning of life, identity crisis, purpose for man. Um, why are we going to talk about this today? Of all the social issues that are out there, and I struggle, you know, when Pastor Pete asked me to teach this class, he's like, go teach social issues. It's like, boom! Like, where do you begin, right? Um, so he's given me great liberty. Thank you, Brother Pete, for doing that. But why, why this issue? Why this issue, meaning of life, identity, crisis, purpose? Because we can talk about anything. Why this? Why is this important? Meaning of life, identity, purpose. Do you ever deal with these issues out there? And like not at the Chinese restaurant with the fortune cookie, the meaning of life. I mean, the, the, the society kind of laughs at it, right? The meaning of life. Like, you picture a meaning of life, some guru on a with Starbucks at the mountaintop, right? No. These, these are big time issues. I would say they're foundational issues. So that's why I wanted to cover this. Um, so we already talked a little bit about the first week's topic. Um, Every social issue, once the minute, ask me this. When we talk about, say, the homosexuality issue, um, abuse, um, drugs, heroin, pick your social issue out there. Gay marriage. And you peel back the onion for it. Does it come back in some way, shape, or form to some of these things? How so? I'm sick of talking. You talk. How? How are these issues foundational? Yeah. I think um, we have, as a society, have gotten so far away from what God designed the purpose of life and life to be that we're searching. And we feel like we can be whatever we want to be. And so you have these people who are probing into drugs or probing, you know, trying to answer the question of, am I valuable? Well, so-and-so said I'm not, so I'm less conscious, so therefore I'm going to numb my pain by drugs or struggling with alcohol or abusing people or being abused. We suicide. Don't value suicide. Um, and then also into this, you know, homosexuality. There's no absolutes that we're dealing with it until we get back to the basis of what God designed us for. Because people without Christ, that's how we're trying to answer that problem on the 
question. Yeah, excellent. Thank you for sharing that. It's a point of departure. So that's why I've decided to talk about these foundational issues. Uh, you saw from the agenda next week, uh, Frank Sunderland is going to talk about alcohol in the church, uh, which is a huge social issue. The week after that, we'll talk about what was on there abortion, sanctity of life, bioethics. Bio you see a lot of that? You are? Yeah. Um, so my hope in teaching this is to provide you some practical things, a practical approach that when you come across an atheist or a homosexual uh, or someone who's been abused or someone who's contemplating suicide or someone with marital issues um, or someone who's just uh, has, a, has a smorgasbord of philosophies out there. If I've done this right, I'm meeting my intent, then you'll have some practical tools to be able to use to at least introduce the topic to them and start talking about it. Okay? Um, who am I? Have you guys ever heard these questions out there as you're door knocking, as you're canvassing, as you're handing out tracts, as you're talking with relatives at family reunions? Who am I? What am I? Why am I here? This is, this is a great one for Gen X, Y, and Z, whatever generation we're on now. Why should I care? Why care? Yeah? Important issues. Important questions. Oh, wait a minute. I don't want you to look. I don't want you to look at that. Um, so if you remember from the first week, when, I was, when we were talking about worldviews, we talked about the importance of, if you're, is your door knocking, say, and, and you can know this book, Genesis to Revelation, and quote scripture up and down. But to someone that doesn't believe that the Bible is the word of God, is that necessarily the best way to approach that person? Not necessarily, per se. Don't get me wrong. I mean, the word of God is, is powerful. Okay. But we talked about having, scaling things back and talking about a common point of reference point where we both can understand something. So before I go to the next slide, when we talk about purpose and design, meaning of life, what's something that all of us, the entire human species, something that we have common ground with, with everybody out there? Meaning of life. What's something that we could all find common ground with and start to understand? Everybody wants to be accepted. Okay. I agree with that. Sure. What do we all share? Say, I'll give you a hint, in a physical sense. We all live and we all know we're going to die at some point. We do? And we all, we're all human. The human species, we're all human. Can we appreciate that? Our humanity? So, as I thought about how to introduce this, the first thing, the following are some good illustrations to share with non-Bible believers because they provide what I think is a good point of reference. All right? Um, how is the human body... Oh, I don't want to hit that again. You tell me. How is the human body different than every other creature in this world? Because evolutionists... What do, the, what is, uh, what do evolutionists say? According to evolutionary thought, do we have, what's our purpose according to evolutionary thought? We're all animals. We're all animals. What's our purpose? What would Darwin say? To evolve survival. We're, we're meant to survive. That's the purpose of life from an evolutionary perspective. Now, obviously, that's not a biblical perspective. What differ, oh, we're just going to get to the point. What differentiates us? What makes us unique as human beings compared to every other living creature out there. And it's really hot. <sighs> we have a soul, so you would say that there is a spiritual, there's a spiritual component? Yeah. A conscience. A conscience, so the ability to reason, think, analyze, okay? What else? Emotions, who said that? We're emotional. My daughter's emotional. Alright? <laughs> Teenagers are emotional. Alright? Uh, we'll talk about that. 
How about, what, what am I doing a very poor job of right now? <laughs> Staying cool? Not sweating. Not sweating, yes. So, can I? I can't. Yeah, I can. Well, my order. Communicating. Communicating. Do, you, do humans communicate unique than any other creature on the face of the earth? Yeah. Alright. I actually want to show you that somewhere else. Alright. The human body is designed not like any other creature. Our ability to communicate, understand, feel emotions, to think rationally shows that we are created, what? For a purpose. That purpose from a biblical perspective is to have a relationship with God. Um, that's just the outside. When we talk about, um, well here, so, so the author, of one of the authors I was reading here, his name's Burgess, right here, Stuart Burgess, he gave an illustration uh, of a knife uh, for a block bell. He's a surgeon. And he says, you know, I once designed a small knife which consisted of a slender rod with a tiny razor sharp blade at the end. One of my students came across the knife and started using it to cut up cards. I explained to him that the knife was something far more important for carrying out life-saving operations on newly born boys who have a blocked bladder bell. You didn't know that, did you? If the student had looked closely at the intricate design of the knife, he would have known it was no ordinary Knife. What do you learn from that? What do you learn from that illustration? Yeah. Design. Design. There's a design of the tool. There's, so what you're trying to do is say there's we have there's a design in us. There's a design. The creator's design is at work in the world around us. So we can, can see his hand at work. Can two people look? at the same object and come to totally opposite conclusions. What's the illustration I used back in week one talking about that? Brother Jones, what's the illustration I used? You should know this, hint, hint, hint. A baby. Evolutionists, humanists would say that is a mass of cells. A Bible believer would say that's a human life created by God. Looking at the same thing, but having two totally different conclusions about it. Okay. Uh, so the important thing that I draw from this is to look closely at the differences. Because there's a purpose for it. There's a reason that knife was designed that way. There's a reason. So here's the whole point. I'm bringing this up. When you're out there door knocking and you co confront someone to say, hey, look in the mirror. Why are you designed the way that you're designed? Because we can all appreciate that. You can talk to someone and say, hey, you see, you hear, you taste, you, you communicate, you feel. That's just all the sensory things, much less the, the, how, 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 the eye, how, how our internal workings work. We have some nurses here. They could explain that. Okay. So we talk about we are no ordinary mass of cells. Evolutionists say... They point to data, I just read this just the other day. Evolutionists point to data showing that 75 to 98% of the uh, ape genome is compared, is, is similar to the human genome. Okay? Um, the human gen genome has over, anybody know how many pieces of data? The human genome, human DNA. How many pieces of information in our DNA? Take a guess. How many pieces of data? 27 what? 3 billion. 3 billion pieces of information. Okay? So, so but here's the point. Evolution would say, hey, let, let's, let's say that it is 98%. An evolution is going to say, hey, you're 98% ape. Therefore, therefore, Obviously, that's evidence that's credence toward an evolutionary chain. But get this, if, you're, if our genome is 3 billion, and they've mapped it, the Human Genome Project, 3 billion, let's say that it is 98%, which by the way, they keep knocking it down as, as they clarify the data. I think now it's down to like 75%. Even if it was 98%, that 2% that's not, think about how many millions and millions and millions and million pieces of data are not ape-like. You are created for a purpose. 
You are different. And there is a reason for that difference. Doesn't that sound rational? Wouldn't someone who's even not a, a, a Bible believer, not even close, wouldn't, wouldn't that be a rational thing to think, hey, there's a reason that you see the way you do, that you feel the way you do, that you think the way you do? Evolutionists would say, <coughs> well, I'm getting ahead of myself. All right. We are more than survival. In contrast, so here. So evolutionists would say we're, we're here for survival. Um, they would say that um, that we're meant to, uh, that our, our, everything that we have, our, our, the way that we think, our body is all engineered simply for survival, but that's not a biblical view. A biblical view, by contrast, reveals that we are unique creatures designed for much more than just survival. We're creative, we're emotional, we're spiritual, we talked about these things. We are designed to have deep relationship with others and our creator. We have a unique ability to be creative in many areas. We have areas in the brain dedicated to the appreciation of beauty and creative thinking. Only humans have thousands, per, and this is just one example. So I put the, the, uh, the diagrams up here. Only humans have thousands of touch sensors on every finger. Only humans have a large part of the brain dedicated to controlling the hands with precision. And the list goes on and on and on. Remember we talked about the life-saving knife? Where you could use that life-saving knife to either save a life or cut boxes? Why are you created? Why are humans created the way we are? Does it make it just logical sense to say that we're created with all these things just to survive? Does that make sense? What I'm trying to see, you see what I'm trying to do in a very poor way as I sweat five gallons up here? <laughs> it doesn't make sense that we are created the way we are just to survive. You see, I use that argument as a, as a respectful counter argument to people you see out there. Let's just talk about this. Thousands and thousands of uh, sensory points on our fingers. An evolutionist would say, how would an evolutionist justify why were we, because the fact is, we do have thousands and thousands of sensors on our fingers. Science tries to recreate it, it's replicated, nowhere near what God has already created. So what would an evolutionist say, how would they justify, uh, that's not the word, how would they support the reason that we are designed the way we are? What would their argument be? Do you need thousands upon thousands of touch points on your fingers in order to just kill, survive, hunt, gather? Do you need that? Does it seem a little overkill? Why are we designed that way? Could you do that while still painting the Sistine Chapel? See the point? We're designed for a purpose, for a reason. It's very logical, actually. Uh, does God like logic? Yeah, there's nothing wrong with logic. Hey, we're designed to communicate. Humans have the unique ability to communicate thoughts and emotions through language. Human speech and writing contain intricate sounds, sophisticated grammar, and thousands of words and now emojis, right? <laughs> <coughs> language enables humans to teach, learn, develop relationships. Language requires many complex design features in the human body. I don't know any of this. This is really cool for me to learn. Large areas of the brain are dedicated to processing speech. Humans have a unique, long throat, agile tongue, fine lips, and precise vocal cords. Up to 100 muscles are at work during communication, and the brain is processing in information at an immense rate to do this. I believe my brain is a little slow right now. All right? Such verbal skills are hardly likely to have evolved just to allow man to be a head hunter. Why would we need to communicate in the way that we do if we were just meant to survive and hunt? Does that make sense? It's very logical. So why do we communicate the way we do? Why were we designed to do that? Because we were created to worship and glorify our creator. That's a biblical perspective. This is where my daughter comes into play. I love her. All teenagers. Designed for emotions, right? Humans are capable of a vast range of emotions. Scientists know that part of the brain is dedicated to emotional feelings. 
But science cannot explain where such feelings come from. I gave you this example on week one. Um, I was down a case, okay, and I'm talking with, uh, I already forgot what, he's double majored in philosophy and genetic engineering or something, and he said this to me. He said, oh, love? Love's just a chemical process. Hope, sadness, fill in the blank. It's just a chemical process. Because for him, if you couldn't study it, and you couldn't quantify it, and you couldn't categorize it, then it, then it didn't exist. Okay. When you love, are there, some, and I'm not, someone correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think I am. I'm sure when you have certain emotions, there's certain, there's a chemical reaction that happens in your body. True? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But it doesn't explain the origin of it, where those feelings come from. They're just not involuntary actions. You see? Where does the choice to want to love, to desire to love, Where's that come from? Science doesn't explain that. We're emotional beings for design. And yet again, is it, would emotion be required in a Darwinian worldview? Why would someone need to be, have the capacity to love or hate or care in a Darwinian world? True? What would, what would the logical purpose of that be? There isn't one. So again, the fact is, we. Anybody who says, well, I don't love and I don't care, well, move on, all right? Go to the next door, all right? <laughs> Most people would agree, yeah, I, I love, I'm happy, I'm sad, I'm this, I'm that. Mm -hmm. Ask them, why? Why do you think you were created that way? Because there's a purpose behind it. You're just not that way because of some evolutionary issue. Am I making sense, or is that just okay? I'm trying to do my best. Um, let's move on. Actually, I, I like this. Can science explain why a human uniquely enjoys a sunset or appreciates a bird song? It reminded me of a Far Side cartoon. Can you? And I, I haven't seen a Far Side cartoon like this, but I imagined one where you have like Bob the Lion and Phil the Bear sitting there, you know, saying, isn't that a beautiful sunset? <laughs> Silly, but do you, animals don't do that. And yet, an evolutionist would say, we are animals, that's all we are. Yet what causes us to enjoy a sunset? Or say, that's beautiful. Where's that come from? It's from our design of who we are. This was just some silly, stupid stuff I put in here. This is a medieval, look at, so the dude's getting stabbed. And look at his expression. <laughs> I'm like, this is lack of emotion. Right? And then, this is something more stupid. So like, if I asked if she likes me, or like, she, me, likes me, she said like, she likes me, like, likes me, like, no? What I really wondered is this, an, is this a beaver? Matter? I don't know what it was. A whole bunch of emotion. That's all I got from it. A whole, whole bunch of liking going on. Finally, we are spiritual beings. Humans are uniquely capable of rational thought, self awareness. We decide what courses of action we take. Why is this a big one? Have you ever acted contrary to your own self-benefit? Whoa! That doesn't fit a Darwinian model. That doesn't fit a survival by the fittest model. Yet, do we do that? Would a Joe, Joe Smith off the street agree with that? To go up to Joe or Susie and say, have you ever acted contrary to your best interest? Well, yeah. Well, then can you explain me how that fits into a humanist Darwinian model? Because it doesn't. So why do we do that? Because we're created to think, to rationalize, because we have a conscience, okay, that we know the Lord gave us. <coughs> All right? Apes don't worry about the meaning of life. 
don't sit around pondering. I wonder what my next move will be. College or laying carpet. All right. The ability to think and decide also means that humans are responsible beings. We are responsible for our actions and accountable to our creator if we break his commands. So there's consequences to this. So this is really interesting. Isn't it convenient then that a byproduct of atheistic thought or humanist thought is the lack of what? Accountability. If, I, if I'm not a rational thinker per se, okay, and there's no God, really it's about having no God. An atheist would say, well, there's no God, therefore there's no accountability. Therefore, I can do what I want to do because there's therefore no consequences. Does that sound convenient? It sounds very convenient. Does it sound like our society? God makes no mistakes. There are no flaws in God's creation. God's registration number is on each of us. He made, up, he made us exactly as he desired to bring him glory. Uh, you don't have to turn there. Tell me, what's a, what's a Bible reference you'd be able to, to, to use to reference about, about a perceived flaw in a person? But God's saying, no, 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 no. That's for my glory. Anyway. What do you got? Okay, we'll get to that one. I thought about um, the blind man. John chapter 9, verses 1 and 3, And Jesus passed by and saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be manifest in him. God made him exactly as God wanted. Now a humanist or a atheist would say, a Darwinian would say, no, there's a flaw there. That's a mistake. And when we start talking about bioethics, just read an article today uh, where they are now able to do selection within the chromosome where they're able to identify flawed DNA and remove it and replace it with desired DNA. Yeah. God makes no mistakes. Um, I want to pause here, and I don't know how this is going to go, um, but I want to pause for a time of personal testimony. Not for me, for you guys. Would somebody be willing to share where they have known someone, where from a world's perspective, there was, the world would say, well, this, oh, I'm so sorry that this happened to this person. But after seeking God's will and working through it, God was truly glorified because of it. I don't know if that makes sense. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Todd. Oh. John Harrison Todd. John Harrison Todd. I don't know her, but John Harrison Todd, Tom Harrison Todd is a good example, don't you think? I can't. Johnny Erickson Tata. Johnny Erickson. Johnny Erickson. She dove into a pool. She broke her neck. She has been a witness for God ever since. She draws yeah. pictures. She. Yeah. Okay. I don't know her. Seriously? I live in a cave. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. This is oh, over. I'm, oh, hey, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Know Who doesn't know? Who's there anybody else besides me that doesn't know this lady? Thank you. Five of you. Are. You're too young. She's our age. Alright, so for us, ignorant type. Give me the backstory. She was a teenager, right, Deborah? She was swimming with her friends. She dove into a lake and broke her neck, paralyzed from the neck down. Terrible story. I mean, young person, you know, what's her life going to be like? But she writes books. She, um, she sings. Yes, she sings. She's an she, artist. She's, she's a wonderful blessing to many, many, many people and brings God to let God have the glory. She's beautiful about the internal. I don't know if you've seen this before. 
Uh, one of my favorite apologists, Ravi Zacharias, he's talked a lot about this. Uh, so the following, I'm going to read this to you. The following is from a book uh, called The Book of Life and Pictures by Zacharias. And I'll abbreviate it here. There's a conference at John Hopkins University on the theme, What Does It Mean to Be Human? Francis Collins, the director of the Human Genome Project and co-mapper of the human DNA, presented his talk. On his last slide, he showed two pictures side by side. On the left appeared a magnificent photo of the stained glass rose window of the New York Minister Cathedral in Yorkshire, England. Its symmetry radiating from the center. Its colors and its geometric patterns spectacular. Clearly, clearly a work of art purposely designed by a gifted artist. Its sure beauty stirred the mind. On the right side of the screen appeared a slide showing a cross section of a strand of human DNA. The picture did more than take away one's breath. It was awesome in the profoundest sense of the term. Just not beautiful, but overwhelming. And it almost mirrored the pattern of the rose window in York Minister. The intricacy of the DNA's design that pointed to the transcendent one astonished those who are themselves the design and who have been created semi-transcendent by design. We see ourselves only partially, but through our creator's eyes, we see our transcendence. And looking at our own DNA, the subject and the object come together. Through our DNA, we see ourselves in another way, as God does. The bottom line of all this, we are vastly different than any other living thing in the world. You need to ask why. Why are we different? How are we different? And for what purpose are we different? If you have your Bibles, and I'm going to start going quickly now. Isaiah, chapter 43, verses 1 through 7. Who would like to read that? Thank you. But now, thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. I gave Egypt for thy ransom, Ethiopia, and Seba for thee. Since thou wast present in my sight, thou hast been honorable, and I have loved thee. Therefore will I give men for thee, and people for thy life. Fear not, for I am with thee. I will bring thy seed from the east, and gather thee from the west. I will say to the north, Give up, and to the south, keep not back. Bring my sons from far, and my daughters from the end of the earth. Even every one that is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory. I have formed him, yea, I have made him. That's how I the love water. Clearly, we're created for Him. We're created for His glory. He gives us everything. We're formed by Him. We're created for Him. We're made by Him. There's a purpose behind it. So now we've kind of answered, at least I hope we've answered a little bit about kind of what we are. But then the question is, well, who am I? It's not about the what, but it's about the who. Who am I? Uh, the author, there's a... Uh, there's an author that told some stories here. He said, a few years ago on an international flight, I found myself in a deep conversation with a woman who was on her way to a New Age self-help conference. You have all the truth you need inside of you, she told me. You are a god, small g. Months earlier, a high, school, high, school, high schooler told me about his abusive father. I'm sorry, I said. You don't deserve that. The young man looked back at me with hollow eyes and said, my dad says that I deserve it. He thinks I'm worthless. Recently, a student leader at a large Christian school admitted to me that he struggled with same-sex attraction. I used to think it was just a phase, he said, but I've come to realize it's just who I am. How'd you respond to these? How'd you respond? They're real questions. They happen every day. Our world is a world of confusion. Throughout our culture, there seems to be an identity crisis. An identity crisis. Who am I? A person who asked that question, who am I? They have a what? Identity 
crisis. They don't know who they are. People do not know who they are. Daily we're, we're bombarded with lies. You are what you look like. You are what you buy. You're just an animal with a conscience. You are whatever you choose to be. You're nothing. No wonder people are confused. Quickly, who causes this confusion? Satan does. Satan does. John 8, 44. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own. For he is a what? A liar and the father of it. Satan is our enemy, not the adulterer, not the homosexual, not the atheist. Something that we touched on on week one. Realize that. We need to realize that. So what's our simple task in this? It's to tell truth. So here, New Age says, hey, and this is, this is just such a small sampling. New Age says, you're a god. What's the truth? 1 Corinthians 8, 1 through 6. I'll just focus on verse 6. It says, But to us there is but one God, the Father, who are all things, and we in Him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom all things, and we by Him. An abused teen out there it says, I'm worthless. I'm going to read all these because they're just so good. How would you respond to that? Someone who's mentally abused, physically abused, who says, I'm nothing. I'm worthless. That's who I am. That's not what God says. Genesis 1.27. Brother Paul, I think you mentioned this. God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he them. Male and female created he them. Your value begins with the fact that you are made by the hand of God, the creator, in his very own image. Romans 5.8 says, But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. The creator loves you so intensely that he allowed his own son to die in your place before you ever repented. The ransom's already been paid. 1 John 3 1 says, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not because it knew Him not. God actually considers you His own child. Would that be sweet words for someone who's contemplating suicide? Yes. Ephesians 4, I'm sorry, 2 4 through 7. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved, and hath raised us together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Your heavenly Father has planned a magnificent, never-ending future for you. How many of, of, our, of our younger generation Say there is no future and decide to take their own life because of it. Suicide rates today are the highest they've ever been in the history of the world. In the military, where I've come from, suicide rates the highest in the history of the military. Why? Because people don't have hope. But there's hope in this book. And there's hope in the reality of Christ. Same-sex addiction. What about someone who says, hey, that's just who I am. God made me that way. How would you respond to that? Well, I'm going to read this passage. It's a little long. Man, can we go to a quarter after? Is that all right? All right, we're going to go to a quarter after. I'm going to read this passage in Genesis 2, 18 to 24. You tell me the number of social issues that this touches, okay? And the Lord, and the Lord God said, it is, it is not good that man should be alone. I'll make him a help me. I'll make a help me for him. And out of the ground the Lord formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helpmeet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she is taken out of a man. Out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife. And they shall both be one flesh. As I read this, what social issues could you use? What does this touch? 
gay marriage. Someone said all of them? <laughs> D! All the above! <laughs> Come on! Gay marriage. Gender issues! Alright? Gender issues. Clearly, man, female. Male, female. From the beginning. What else? That animals don't aren't equal to us, that we have dominion. Dominion. Okay? Stewardship, dominion. Good. Uh, what about sexual partners in the context of marriage? Heterosexual marriage, creation, gender roles. Alright. Alright. Purpose for man. Now, I gotta get to there's something I really, really This blows me away. God provides clear evidential purpose for us. Do you know what evolution, what, what, what's, uh, what's the evidence for evolution when it comes to purpose? Does, a, does an evolutionist give hope? Is there hope in evolution? What's the end product of evolution? What is it? Death, game over, right? That's a loving philosophy, right? This is awesome. Man is God's purpose with creation. We already covered this verse. Man is the object of God's love. The Lord hath appeared unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. Man is the purpose of God's plan for redemption. Man is the purpose of the mission of God's Son. In this was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. We, man, are the purpose for God's inheritance. That being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And heaven is our destination. What's the center? Does it, is it clear that who's the focus of God's attention? Man! Who's the center of a humanist attention? Self. Does God love you? That's why he designed this what he did. Alright, this is really cool. I think it's cool. You give me a bomb. Who knows? Alright. Um, this, this, this isn't cool. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm going to have a video. I came across this video. Who, lo who knows uh, Elon Musk? Who is he? Nathan. Founder of Tesla and PayPal. PayPal, Tesla, SpaceX. SpaceX. 35, 40, billionaire. All right. He has a video here. I'm going to show you a video. According to Elon Musk, this is the meaning of life. I want to hear from you after, we, after I show this video. What you agree with. What you disagree with. And why. What you agree with, what you disagree with. And why. Because this is the same argument you get out there. All right, um, wait till I get this rolling, then you can cut the lights. If you look at the... Can you cut the lights, please? The, the progress in space. In 1969, we were able to send some... Oh, wait a minute. Give me the lights back. All right. <laughs> Play quickly. Uh, what's... What are you Alright, If you look at the, at the progress in space, in 1969, we were able to send something to the moon. 1969, um, they only had this, the space shuttle. The space shuttle could only take people to lower orbits. Then the space shuttle occurred, and the United States could take no one to orbit. So that's the trend. The trend is that down to nothing. This is what people are mistaken when they think that technology just automatically improves. It does not automatically improve. It, it only improves if a lot of people work very hard to make it better. And actually, it, it will, I think, it will by itself degrade, actually. If you look at big civilizations like ancient Egypt, and they always make the pyramids, and they forgot how to do that. Uh, and the Romans, they built these incredible acrobats. They forgot how to do it. Why, why, you know, this is, this, like, why do we need to build a city on Mars with a million people on it in your lifetime? 
which I think is kind of what you said you have to do. Yeah, I think it's important to have um, the future of that is inspiring and feeling it. I just think that the, like, there have to be reasons that you get up in the morning and you want to live. But why do you want to live? What, what's the point? What, what inspires you? What, what do you love about the future? And if, if we're not out there, if the future is not included being out there among the stars uh, and being a multiplied species, I find it that it's incredibly depressing if that's not the future that we're going to have. Um, You know, he was saying that we need to have a purpose in life. We need to have something to look forward to. I think he's just looking forward to the wrong things. Okay. Um, so from that, you could say uh, aspiration. Yeah. Is aspiration a bad thing? No, not necessarily. Technology a bad thing? Not necessarily. What did you disagree with? Disagree with anything? The definition of future. What's the definition of future? The definition of future was to make the world better so there would be a future for our mortal bodies. I may create a future that might break the grandchildren. But if you don't, if you don't believe it for the soul, like I'm sure he doesn't, his future that he's building put into people now will be the end of it. Um, his zenith, his what he would call a success, and this is just my assessment of it, I may be wrong. Uh, what would you say that his definition of success is in his lifetime? The, the interviewer actually kind of brought it up. Right there. If the future doesn't include being among the stars, being a multi-planetary species, it's incredibly depressing. <coughs> I'm just trying to think about a future and not be sad. Achievement, I think, is his meaning of life. Achievement is his meaning of life. Let me share one last thing with you and then we've got to go. Oh, oh, by the way, does he have answers to any of this? He asked these questions. You have to have a reason to get up in the morning and want to live. I agree with that. Um, why do you want to live? What is the point? Does he have answers to any of that? Who does? For sake of time, I'm just going to cut. Well, here, no, no. In closing, take heed, don't spoil. Therefore, we ought to give to the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. We need to pay careful attention to preaching, teaching, and study. Because you know what this says? This says that we can drift really easy. Stick close because it's easy to drift. Secondly, Colossians 2.18. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. What this says is don't let false teaching pull you away from receiving your reward, which is, what's our reward? Knowing him. Wisdom and knowledge. Paul says, I've given up everything in order to know him. True wisdom and knowledge. And I just love this book. The Lord has really taught me something with Colossians 2.8. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of this world, and not after Christ. Boy, doesn't that just reek of today? Yeah. You know what spoil means? Be, this is my last point. I'll let you guys go. 
Thank you for, for sticking around. <laughs> Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men and the rudiments of this world and not after Christ. The word spoil here, it's a Greek word. It means will be, shall be, should be. God has a plan for you. What he wants you to be, who he wants you to be, what he's already determined he wants, what you will be if you follow after him. We get spoiled, we get off track when we stray from him. I thought that was so appropriate for today.